it came down to this. The manager that hired me gave me an ultimatum. Look, David, either you can talk like a girl and bring up your numbers, or I'm going to have to let you go. I'm sorry. I laughed because I had no idea how I could ever do a convincing female voice to keep my job as a phone sex worker. It was 1988. I was 22 years old, and I'd been in San Diego maybe a month when I went on an interview for a phone sex operator. The month before, I had left New York City where I'd been trying to find myself. Outside of a little bit of community college, I had no idea what I wanted to do with this phase of my life. The only constant was, was that I looked like I was auditioning for the Ramones. <laughs> I thought the look really suited me but the haircut and the holes in my jeans didn't leave, exactly leave me with any job prospects. My options, my options were washing dishes, working in a record store, or maybe, maybe the exciting world of telemarketing. <laughs> I always hated the idea of using the word sir or ma'am in any job, so I opted for the phone sex worker position. <laughs> this job did not require me to audition with a sexy monologue. I was hired solely because when they asked me if I could work graveyards, I said, yep. <laughs> Plus, there was no drug test. <laughs> the, company, the company ran late night television ads, videos of blonde, buxom young ladies talking to each other on the phone while playing spin the bottle and drinking champagne. <laughs> the voiceover said, me and my friends are looking to speak with exciting men. <laughs> the calls only cost $3.99 for three minutes of exciting fun. So it was my duty as the operator to initiate exciting fun <laughs> conversation with the callers. The callers, the callers were mostly guys um, calling in to speak to girls, and I, of course, am a guy, the only guy that worked there, so I dug down deep into my job faking skills, and I came up with this young, smoky drawl, actually making me sound kind of somewhat believable. What I picked up from the real girls I worked with in the office was that they could speak to these hordes of men without hardly ever having to get sexual. These calls are really like a bunch of first dates talking about favorite TV shows, music, uh, where you live, how tall you are. Occasionally, some guy just wanted to talk about how swollen his balls were. <laughs> I was a 22-year-old red-blooded guy. I wanted to have sex without a telephone in my hand. So for every 25 guys that were phoning in, there were actually a few girls calling in. And a couple of those few girls kept calling back to speak to me. All this was new to me. Coming, <laughs> co coming of age, I suffered from acute low self-esteem. I had bad skin. I was an awkward, gangly-looking kid. I, I couldn't play sports. I didn't even understand sports. I was shunned by anyone remotely popular, especially the girls. I gravitated, I gravitated toward this other scene. I, I had long hair, and I, and I like punk rock. Now, for my male voice on this job, I had chosen the moniker Joey. This was after my childhood idol, Joey Ramone. And with the attention of these girls, I was, I was Joey Ramone, <laughs> the unlikely desirable rock star. I, I went from having low self-esteem and absolutely no clue how to ever talk to girls, period, to being in a job where I was talking to girls about sex every night. <laughs> Some of them even asked me to meet them in person so we could do more than talk. But despite the rosy self-descriptions these girls gave me, I had no delusions. <laughs> I was pretty confident that if I met these girls in person, they would be hideous. But even besides that, the office had a rule, one single rule we were to abide by the one single rule, do not ever, ever, under any circumstances, give out the address or location of the office. <laughs> ever. Don't do that. <laughs> Everything else was fair game, as long as we didn't break this rule. It was, it was in a frame sign on every desk. It was also etched across my brain. 
To meet any of these people in person would be phone sex jihad. I came to embrace this job, really. Um, I, I, like, I, like I was a radio talent, uh, people would tune in to me and what I might say or do. Th these were just characters that I played, like, like putting on an apron um, that I would take on and off when I was going to go to work. I suspect that Rush Limbaugh, in real life, he wears Birkenstocks. <laughs> he masturbates to Rachel Maddow. <laughs> and he really enjoys NPR on the weekends. In my, in my female voice, I was Jennifer. This was after my pet cat, Jenny. <laughs> Jennifer, she looked just like me at the time, tall. Maybe 5'8", five 5'9", five without her heels on. Long, dark hair, blue eyes, just like me. But of course, she wore a bra because her breasts were considerably larger. I was thinking maybe like a B or a C cup. Um, and I quickly made Jennifer's character very attracted to women because um, this made it easier for me to relate to. And, her, and as her voice may have suggested, she wasn't, she wasn't a prom queen, but she wasn't exactly paying, playing softball either. <laughs> so my biggest fan, or I should say Jennifer's, Jennifer's biggest fan was a guy named Todd. Whenever he called and I answered as Joey, Todd made it immediately clear to me that he thought I was a faggot. <laughs> Those were his exact words. <laughs> I don't like you, Joey, because you're a faggot. <laughs> Todd would call in incessantly, especially on the weekend. He had horrible taste in music. He was into bands like Styx and Toto. <laughs> he loved movies with Chuck Norris. And don't even get Todd started on the WWF. <laughs> he believed Hulk Hogan was the Messiah. <laughs> now, I had known guys exactly like Todd for years. In elementary school, Todd was the same guy that never, never picked me for dodgeball. In junior high, he was the guy that stole my lunch out of my locker and ate it in front of me. By high school, Todd was the guy that threw a milk carton at me through the window of his Camaro. So meeting him years later, when he called into the phone sex line that I worked at, it was a goddamn miracle. <laughs> Sometimes just to rile Todd up, to rile Todd up, I would, I, I would use my joy voice to talk to Todd about how great an ass that Jennifer had. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes. <laughs> I would tell Todd that Jennifer couldn't come to the phone because she was in the office taking a giant shit. <laughs> this pissed Todd off to no end. Because as much as we spoke, he never once crossed the line with any mention of sex or any indecen indecency towards Jennifer. He was locked in the friend zone. <laughs> what a chump. <laughs> this was my revenge. Now, I got, used to t I got used to Todd calling me a faggot all the time. It, it was kind of like when you go into a liquor store and the guy behind the counter says, Hey, boss. Hello, chief. <laughs> so in Todd's world, in Todd's world, the worst thing you could be or call someone else was gay. And this made it all the more fun for me to tell the truth about Jennifer, about Joey, and about me, the truth. <laughs> Yeah, right, that's bullshit, Todd said. Just let me talk to Jenny already. That's what I want to talk to you about, Todd. <laughs> there is no Jennifer. It's been me you've been talking to the whole time. In this fake made-up voice, I came up with to keep guys like you spending their money. <laughs> Nothing personal. <laughs> and then, in my Jennifer voice, I greeted him the same way I did every time he called. Oh, hi, Todd. <laughs> the line went quiet for a minute. Then I heard Todd say, I ain't no faggot. <laughs> and he hung up. There was a girl. 
There was a girl I would talk to pretty regularly and always about sex. Her name, her name was Sarah. I could tell Sarah was different from the other ones. It was how she carried herself in our conversations. She wasn't really interested in me telling her a bunch of nice guy stuff about how cute she sounded. I sensed, I sensed that she was used to guys telling her how attractive she was all the time. She never felt the need to embellish her own self-description. It was only when I started saying things to her like, you sound pretty desperate, Sarah, <laughs> or why are you spending your money to talk to a bunch of weirdos? <laughs> and with that, she responded flirtatiously, I just want to talk to you, David. I started to envision uh, Sarah as that popular girl in high school. Yes, she was a cheerleader. Yes, she went to her prom. She even had a husband, the same guy she went to the prom with. But she made it clear that she wasn't desperate. She was just bored and looking for kicks. I must admit, I was just as human as the next guy at 2 AM. So after too many months and so much dirty talk, she finally said, we should just meet and fuck already. <laughs> she was right, we should. She, she really was the exception to the kind of girls that normally called in, and she would be the exception to the one office rule. I told her to meet me at the AM PM. It was on Imperial and Euclid. <laughs> I told her, call the office line from the payphone, and from my second story office window, I could see the payphone under the streetlight. This was it. 20 minutes later, the private Lang rang in the office. It was Sarah looking out the window. I saw that she was everything she had described to me. The perfect girl next door type. Bingo. Awesome. In my best ransom exchange voice, <laughs> I said, go in the store and grab some wine coolers. <laughs> and I'll come meet you in the parking lot. We, we quickly got past our, our overdue in-person introduction, and maybe, maybe a half a wine cool later, we consummated what we had been talking about for months. I decided as long as I had her there, and I was at work, I figured I'd put her to use and give the callers an extra treat. <laughs> I handed her the receiver, and I let her have her breathing fill in for exciting fun. I remember thinking, Man, my quota must be jumping right now. <laughs> Later that morning, I heard the door unlock an hour earlier than expected. It all happened in slow motion. My boss spied the trail of clothes littering the office carpet, the empty wine coolers. <laughs> the gig was up. <laughs> the boss caught us both trying to recover our pants. I, I knew I'd be fired, but at that moment, I was, I was okay with it. <laughs> I think I had earned my retirement having done everything I could have hoped to get away with. Some jobs have perks, <laughs> like, like Hawaiian shirt day or <laughs> free pizza lunch Fridays, <laughs> or maybe getting your picture in a frame for employee of the month. The perk here, the perk here was doing what every human being wanted to do. I had lost my fear of rejection. Yes, I had broken the golden rule, and I gave the whole secret up to our operation. Besides our location, the real secret, the real secret was that we were all just lonely people too. People that, that needed somebody to tell us that we were funny, that we sounded cute, that we seemed clever, that we were desired. Sure, the callers were paying for that service, but I was looking for it too. I might have been getting paid to do it, but I was just as desperate as Todd. David Latham.